Welcome to the Fashion Insiders podcast. This is your source for straight talking, no fluff fashion business conversations that add real value to the way passionate fashion entrepreneurs live, work and thrive. Having the courage to start your own fashion brand and business, design, develop and manufacture your products can be tough and lonely process. It may not be easy, but it can be simple. I'm your host, Desi, and I'm here to show you how to optimize your performance as a fashion entrepreneur and brand owner so that you can launch and grow a fashion business that is profit-rich, efficient, and can scale online and offline. And when done right, it allows you to generate a real tangible wealth for yourself and others. Let's go. Hey, Jane. Hi, how are you? Yeah, not bad. How are you? I'm awesome today. Thanks. Good. You are all the way in? I'm in Chicago. Chicago, Okay, and I'm in London. 23 degrees right now. Oh, really? No, 11 here. So... (laughs) Which I don't even know in Celsius. I have to figure that out. <laughs> oh, it's cold. As far as I'm concerned, it's cold. So listen, I oh thought that God. we can connect and chat a little bit about uh, what's, uh, how the fashion industry and small brands are getting affected at the moment with everything that's going on around the world. And also Absolutely. we can maybe compare some notes of what's working you know, in Europe, America, and give some tips to small brands how to navigate these interesting times we live in. Perfect. Yes, yeah. I'm so down. Yes. So, so what's your background? I know you were, uh, you know, you were, you had your own business. You were a designer. You had your own brand. Yeah. So I, when I was 25 years old, I opened up a retail store and I designed all of the clothes for the store. Um, I, they're manufactured here in Chicago, where my boutique was, and also in New York. And six months after opening up my shop, I was approached by a big box retailer. Um, Marshall Fields, now Macy's, and they said, do you sell wholesale? And I was like, yeah, of course. (laughs) So I started shipping my first big box store six months after opening, like shipping. Wow. And I went on to sell the Bloomingdale's and Saks and a lot of, you know, hundreds of specialty stores across the country. And I had reps in five different cities. So I had this wholesale and direct to consumer brick and mortar shop. And, um, I designed most of the clothes in the store. And then a lot of it was wholesale. We did catalogs, all the things, whatever. And then after 14 years and two kids, I decided to sell it after my second son was born. He had a lot of health challenges and it was going to be rough. Things were rough. Um, He's great now. He's awesome. Um, And so then after I sold the business, I did retail consulting for a while, inventory um, control, inventory forecasting, open to buy, marketing, all the things. And then I started Fashion Brain and I love helping other people do what I do. And I really focus on, or what I did, I should say. And my my focus is really on um, getting, helping small brands get traffic online and get sales. Because a lot of us, when we go into it, we're designers, right? And we're really good at like designing a product and picking out the fabrics, but you know, marketing and content and emails. It's not our first choice of what we want to do all day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so that's what I specialize in because having a great product, nobody knows about that's not going to be super helpful. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause I similarly like you in a similar sort of years, uh, time span, uh, I entered the fashion industry after graduating, working for brands for luxury brands and creating product. And back in those days, I don't know if you remember, but 20 plus years ago, very often you were your own designer in many brands. This is before the cult of the big designers. Mm -hmm. And so developing products came really easy to me. And later on, I, 10 years after working for the industry, I launched my own fine jewelry brand because I thought, you know, I know how to develop product, but where I stumbled was the whole sales simply because I just refused to sell. I just thought my product is gorgeous. (laughs) And I just didn't really make an effort. <laughs> Build it and they will come, right? Yeah, co- correctly, yes. Yeah. So now after building a platform about manufacturing and shutting it down three years ago, like you, I pivoted to working with brands and helping them with all of that experience, how to you know, launch and grow profitable and successful brands because if you build it, they don't just come. No, That's they don't. And I'm sure, I think we all felt that, you know, 
I was like, I have lots of friends and family and they shopped and they bought and they were awesome for the first week. And then I was like, I have this high rent in Lincoln Park in Chicago. And I'm like, okay, I see people walking by. You Don't you see my store here? I, like, don't you see my windows? Like, why aren't they coming in? Like, I was really just like, I didn't know it was going to be like this, you know? Yeah. So what were you, because on your website, when um, I was reading, um, you said something that you had a lot of hard lessons that you learned. What were like some of them? Oh God. Like, okay. So <laughs> first of all, I knew how to design a product. I knew how to find a pattern maker, I knew how to source fabric sort of, right. But I knew nothing about business. I opened up a retail store having worked for a total of three weeks over Christmas break at a big department store in retail. Okay. So I opened up this retail store thinking I know things. Um, and I'm a good designer here's like the top few things that I screwed up in the beginning pricing a hundred percent to the point where the day before I opened my store, a mentor, a woman in Chicago who was in the industry, who worked for a not-for-profit and she was an amazing human. She visited the shop and she comes to the store and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm launching tomorrow. My big party's tomorrow. And she looks around. She's like, Oh, Jane, everything's so beautiful, lovely. Oh my God, you're amazing. And I'm like soaking it all in. And then she goes, and honey, you are selling these at wholesale prices and you will be out of six, out of business in six months. Oh, my taxi's here. Gotta go. Like literally walked, like dropped that bomb and walked out the door. And I freaked out. I was like, I don't want to do all this work and be out of business in six months. And yet I had a huge pricing fear of, you know, I'm 25 years old when I opened the store. I wouldn't pay that much for a dress. How could I ask other people to pay that much for something I wouldn't even pay for myself? Not realizing that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> really, it's like, what does the customer think is a fair price, right? Yeah. So I stayed up all night, stared at the ceiling, lost my mind and decided I'm not going to do, I'm going to go balls out. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to go out of business in three weeks instead of six months. Okay. So I doubled the prices on everything the next day as much as I could. And um, thank God I did. And things sold because I would have been completely screwed building up an audience based on one price point yeah. and then having to either go out of business because I didn't have any money, no cash flow, no margins, or I would have had to start over building a new clientele at the correct margins. Yeah. So that was, that was rough. Isn't it amazing uh, how 25 years on the same problems exist? Yes. Oh my God. People do it all the time. Yeah. Crazy. And right? sometimes they don't know the margin. Sometimes they get some really bad information off some dummy on YouTube who sells seven t-shirts last week, you know, and sometimes they're like me where they kind of know what they should do, but they don't do it because they're afraid. Yeah. I think yeah. the fear factor is huge. It's huge. It's yeah. so huge. And it was, I mean, it, it still was one of the most painful decisions of my life to figure out. Yeah. It was so scary. It was so scary. Yeah. 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 But better at least to do it in the beginning than later. I've, I've worked with so many people who've just had to completely start over really having that same mindset of, I want to give people a good deal. You know? Yeah. 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 Do you know, one of my lessons when I was doing my brand was that I launched my brand in 2008 when the recession happened and mm -hmm. uh, it was very expensive, 18 karat gold with gems, etc. <clears throat> and I decided that I needed to get advice from people who have been there, done it, survived the whole recession in the past. So I seeked out some advice from successful jewelry business people. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't think that, you know, I didn't think to look for someone who was doing 18 karat gold. So I got advice from people who built silver brands and they were like, forget a gold, go, go into silver. So I went and <laughs> created on top of my 18 karat gold, I went and created silver collections, which I absolutely hated. And therefore, whenever, you know, I was doing trade shows or seeing shops, even if they took orders in silver, I just would not deliver them. I just did not want my brand to be in silver. <laughs> you're, you're like your body would not let you do it. Like the resistance was just too yeah. big. Yeah. Wow. And it's so interesting because we see, oh, that's working for them. I better do that. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it's only natural. I've done it. I do it still. But number one, 
do you really know if it's working for them, right? We're not looking at their books. We don't know their margins. We don't know if they're really making money or they just have an amazing social media presence sometimes, yeah. right? And, and number two, who cares? <laughs> they love selling silver. You hated it, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah. It, I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's so many things that I look back on. I'm like, it would have been a really simple fix. Like to think, you know, when I opened up my, uh, when, from a retail standpoint, I did not have a back room in, I didn't have a back room. I didn't have a place for overstock or backstock. I didn't know about overstock or backstock. Of stock management, just, yeah. No, I just, over, I mean, later I became a retail consultant, which was, that's all we did, right? But all I thought was open up with this many pieces. And the way I decided how many pieces to you to open was I measured, you know, I took a ruler, <laughs> and a tape measure, and I was like, okay, a 48 inch rack holds this many units and I have room for this many racks. Order that many, done never thinking about what happens when it sells. Yeah. Funny, I had a similar lesson along those lines with collections. I put so much money into these expensive jewelry pieces and they were big with a lot of gold and gems and things like this. And then I had this horrific silver, right? And there was a lady, she's passed away now, but she, she was a jewelry consultant out of New York. And I booked the trip and I went to see her. And she just took one look at my collections, made two piles. One was a smaller pile, one was a bigger pile. And she said, the bigger pile, forget about it. That's not working. This is, your, this is what it's about. And she, even though I had been for 10 years in the industry, she was the one who taught me about the importance of product range and how you build collections and all of that. So then... No wonder brands are not growing and stock runs out if you're not, you know, ranging it properly. So on point, especially if you're selling wholesale, you know, yeah. you know, these days direct to consumer with your website, sometimes you can be very, very item driven or only have one or two products and make a really nice living. But if you're, if like when I was, would show up and I'm selling to Saks Fifth Avenue, forget it. Like if I didn't have a tight collection, they wouldn't even look at me, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> correct. Yeah. So interesting. You mentioned wholesale because you were like geared up towards wholesale so much. What's your opinion of wholesale at the moment, post pandemic? You know, I have a love hate relationship with it. I, I think the internet is the best thing that ever happened to entrepreneurs and I like, I think that people should do what is right for them. Yeah. For some people, wholesale is right for them. But for many, it's just one slice. And I often think it's a good idea not to tackle wholesale and direct to consumer online at the same time. Yeah. Like if you start with direct to consumer and you do well and you grow that, the, the, the stores will fi find you and, yeah. and want to buy from you. Um, but trying to do both at the same time, I mean, it, that is, it is not recommended to sell to a major department store within six months of opening. Okay. Let's just say I totally messed up because I didn't have a, a good um, coach, a mentor. I didn't know the lingo. And so one day, Desi, I get this order from Marshall Fields and it's like a $40,000 order. And I'm like, oh shit, I got to go find, you know, 18 grand to produce it or whatever I needed. Right. <laughs> and so I get this order. And I'm all excited. And I fly back to, first of all, they said, will you come show us your line in Minneapolis? And I lived in Chicago and I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And I look at flights and they're $550. And it's like a 45 minute flight. And, and this was, you know, how many years ago? And I was like, I don't have that money. I can't. And I just charged it. Right. So like you take, I took major risks and I was like, fuck it, whatever. I'm going there. If I get an order, I'm going to figure it out. Right. So I charge the ticket. I go there. I show the line. I so didn't know what I was doing. They said to me, so what's your delivery? And I go, um, delivery. Uh, and she goes, I'm thinking like, I don't know, via truck probably like, and so she says, what I mean, Jane is if we place an order with you, when will you ship it? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so like I'm counting on my fingers, like one month, two months, how about April? And she's like, yeah, how about April 15th? I'm like, okay, that sounds good. Okay. So I get this order. So dumb. I go home. The assistant buyer ca calls up and she says, Jane, we're so excited about your order. We're, we're putting in the PO now. And while like, okay, it's confirmed. Uh, just one quick question. Um, 
with most of our vendors, we do eight, 10 EOM terms. Would that be good with you? And I was like, sure, if that's what you do with most of your vendors. And I said, yes, not knowing what it was. Eight to 10 EOM is basically I gave away an 8% discount when they'd already placed the order. I didn't need to do that. And so just not knowing some of the terms, some of the language, some of the, um, you know, custom, like how do you order fabrics? Um, what's the best way if somebody does come into my store, what's the best way not to scare them off? Like just basic things about human psychology, what it takes to get a sale, what makes a good offer when you're selling something. And then some of those just terms, like I didn't, I didn't have, we didn't learn that in school, right? Mm -hmm. I went to FIT and we learned how to be a designer, assuming we'd be a designer for a big brand. So yeah. I didn't know business. I and didn't you know, know, wholesalers, American wholesalers are really tough compared to the Europeans. I mean, you're hardcore. Hardcore. And I was hardcore when I had a store. I mean, I was hardcore. And so, I mean, yeah, the, here's the one, there's one amazing thing that's happened in the States recently, a company called FAIR, F-A-I-R-E. Are you familiar with them at all? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what they do is they have a brilliant business model. So if you guys don't know, I'll just briefly explain it. Yep. If I, let's say I'm the designer of these sweaters, okay? I can list my products on FAIR, assuming you get accepted. And the retailers can buy the products with a guarantee that they can return them if they don't sell. And the vendor gets paid as soon as you ship the product. So there's really like no risk for so it's either. Kind of, it's kind of product. like sale or return, but getting paid up front. Exactly. It's almost yeah. like consignment yeah, in yeah. a sense. And, but what's brilliant, I was like, how could FAIR do this? How could they possibly take things back from all these crazy retailers? Me being one of them. What they do is then they have a third element of the business where they sell direct to consumer. Because a lot of times the pieces that would get returned, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just, it wasn't a fit for their store. So they are making money on all the ends, yet everybody has a risk reversal. So in that case, wholesale is pretty awesome. But I, I am a huge, I, I, most of what I do is work with brands for direct to consumer because I think it's just way more fun yeah. to have lots of little bosses than just a few big bosses. And, yeah. you know, you sort of feel like you're at the mercy of these stores if they are continuing to place volume. Yeah. Um, at the same time, having some wholesale strategy can be amazing because it can really pad your orders and yeah. you can get better prices because of yeah, and also for authority and visibility, it's amazing. True. Right. You know what? It's street cred. Yeah. Yeah. But right. I feel like it's really lost its way. It's really changed. There's less and less boutiques and independents who kind of really aspirational. You know, and also, you know, they're really kind of struggling now. So the payment terms are not there. I mean, they're really not supportive of up and coming brands. I don't think they have been in a million years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know but, if they ever were. But post pandemic, I feel like they're so, they're so risk averse. It's yeah. like mind blowing. Well, I'll tell you this. I, I, so, so when I was around, um, I was around in 19, 2001. 9-11 happened and I mean business stopped yeah. and then in 2008 um you know I have a, a friend who she had orders for like I don't know 36 stores and I think 32 of them canceled their orders wow right so I'm a big fan of diversifying your sales yeah. channels and your risk yeah um, now when something like the 2008 recession happens 9-11 happens, it's out of our control, 100%. Yeah. Um, what we can control is how how deep into any one channel or any one retailer um, or any one anything, any one manufacturer, you know, like I, do, I like to spread the love among different contractors as well, because I had a contractor did a ton of business with us. She closed up for a month and went to Poland when her mom died. And I couldn't get my stuff. I couldn't get my patterns, like nothing. Everything shut down. Yeah. And so I was like, note to self, always have a legit backup factory, no matter what. Yeah, so never have all your eggs in one basket. 
Yeah, totally. I remember in 2008, so many big brands and small brands went out of uh, business because oh, yeah. when the going was good, they were sitting on so much stock. And then when the recession came, they just couldn't shift it. Yeah. And I remember one particular brand, I'm not going to mention the name, but literally every month she had some for sale. It was great. But I think that ultimately devalued her brand. She barely scraped through, but I think it, her brand was never the same since then. And factories yeah, but, went bust. I mean, inventory is the biggest. I mean, it's the it's your biggest expense, really. Yeah. And so, if you're sitting on inventory as a retailer, oof, I mean, whatever you can do to minimize your risk with inventory on hand is advisable. I always suggest order the minimum. Like even if you're getting started with labels and um, hang tags, like anything. I know you're going to pay more if you order the minimum but you're probably going to change your mind. You're probably going to, you may have to change the name of your business. Like until you really know what's happening, pay a little bit more to get the minimum of everything. So your risk is, um, you're not as vulnerable. Yeah. I think. Don't you love it when I get often designers who say, oh, I found a factory and the MLQ is like 300 or 500 units and they haven't even started. And I'm like, how are you going to sell so many units? But they yeah. seem to think, to have a game plan, SEO, Facebook ads, this, that, the other. It's so easy to think that you're going to shift 500 units, but the reality is. Especially the, the ones that are more, the most difficult to try to explain this to are ones who work for bigger brands already. Cause they're like, well, at, at blah, 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 we sell, you know, 3000 units of something. And, you know, I, it's hard to explain, like they have a sales system. You don't have any of that. Yeah. And, and also to understand the, slim um percentage of people that come to your site who actually make a purchase you know a conversion for a website is you know between one and three percent so if you want to get one sale today you need a hundred people today yeah. at least mm -hmm. especially if you're new right and lower if you are a higher end brand <clears throat> yeah which doesn't and, mean it's a, and, a bad thing it's just a lot of traffic and it has to be the right audience Totally. Yes. Good point. Yeah. Just so getting I, eyeballs on your site is not going to yeah. help if it's, you know. Yeah. But so I think that we live in quite an interesting time at the moment. It's kind of, I swing between excited and freaked out um, uh -huh. at the moment, but um, you know, there's a real kind of sense that with all the sanctions that are being happening on Russia at the moment with the current war in Europe, with the inflation and everything, we are at the precipice of something like a big recession or something and I know that I don't know about the U.S. but the brands I work with you know sales are happening but it's kind of a hard going what what would you advise what do you advise you know for brands who are kind of scared you know so I think we're Americans and so we're very much concerned about ourselves <laughs> and yes everyone is standing with the Ukraine we're very deeply saddened with all the things, but we don't feel it the way you do. Okay. We see, you know, yes, inflation is high, but the stock market's fine. Like, I don't think it's as prevalent here as you guys might be having. Mm -hmm. um, so what I see working though with people and what I strongly recommend is if you have a relationship with the customer you as a brand or you as the owner with the customer, that is the most important thing, right? So I guess what I mean is this, like if you if you own, let's say Starbucks, everybody knows Starbucks, okay. Yeah. If Starbucks all of a sudden figured out, oh my gosh, I'm just gonna riff out here, but like coffee causes 28 kinds of cancer and you'll lose your fingernails and you can never drink it again, okay. And then they just started selling mud water and tea. There's still a ton of people who will go to Starbucks because we just love the atmosphere. We love the way they, they'll put our special milk in. We like the chairs. We like the smell, although that would change with the coffee. So if we just like them, we like that interaction. We like the logo, whatever it is, mm. we'll buy anything from Starbucks. So a lot of us are going to still go there every day, no matter what they're selling. And that's the same for a brand, right? So if you have a relationship with the customer and they trust you and they know you and they like you, and, and let's say the pandemic happens and all of a sudden you're selling like sweatshirts and stuff, that's, that can totally work. 
like even if even if you you know let's say something happens and you're like okay this is a recession i can no longer sell thousand dollar dresses um maybe i need to pivot to a different product um they'll often stay with you if yeah. they really like you they'll buy anything you want to sell them yeah so not everybody but a certain percentage yeah so what, what I see is when a brand has a movement behind it or a real strong purpose, they're never going to have a problem. Yes, things are going to be wavy, right? Yeah. But the brands that are niched tightly are doing really well. Yeah. The brands that are like, I have a cute red sweater, much harder, much yeah. harder. And also so from my... Point? Yeah, from my point of view, in recession, you always have opportunities that just appear all of a sudden. Could be a new trend, it could be you know the demand change to something else. And if you have a verse diversified manufacturing base, you can, you know, adapt and offer something new. Yes, I mean we don't. None of us want to end up like Blockbuster, right? Yeah. We don't. But what I've noticed also in the last couple of years, and and I'm not exactly sure if it's pandemic related or not, is what I've noticed is people who are designers or they own a brand or they're a blogger or they're whatever, they're much more willing to cross over into something else. So yeah. like I work with a lot more people now who are offering a class and they're teaching something yeah. in addition to their physical product. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes they're re related and it's the same audience and sometimes it's not, yeah. but it's sort of like that actor who all of a sudden starts singing and they're like, why don't you just stick to acting? Well, what, why? You're yeah, good at both. I'm, I'm a real supporter of the idea of omnichannel, you know, bringing different yes. sources of revenue. You just cannot, you know, the, if, it's, if one thing the pandemic taught us is that you cannot just have one source of income. That's it. You know, my suggestion for anyone listening who may be struggling or they're worried about they will be struggling to take 80% of your business and just do what's solid that you feel is going to work. And the other 20% to take huge risks, yeah. ridiculous risks. Like when I had a clothing store, all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to do duvets. I'm going to do, I found this fabric. I was like, this is perfect for bedding. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put in, you know, if my budget is a hundred thousand dollars in inventory for this period, I'm going to put 20 grand into this new thing and promote it. That did not work. <laughs> I was about to say risky. That one didn't, but the next time I did baby blankets, that kicked ass. And yeah. then I had a whole baby blanket business that I sold wholesale online, all of it. But, um, you know, like we have to be willing to do something different. Yeah. If you're like, but I am a sweater designer. That's what I do. Well, I don't know. Maybe you sell candles too. Like, like just don't be blockbuster. Just don't say I didn't see it coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, completely. Things are going to get weird. I think you're right. I think things are going to get weird with the economy. And we don't even know what that means. Mm. So do you have a deep enough relationship with the person on the other side of that transaction that they're going to stay with you and go with you and you are able to ask them and find out what are you guys doing now? What are you buying? What do you yeah. need? How can I help? And also you don't need my red thing. sweaters. Maybe I yeah, can do something else, you know? Another thing to remember is that money don't just disappear. They just move hands. So it's a question of, you know, finding where's your audience shifted? Has it shifted or do you need to find it anew? Because money's just moved. Money just moves. It, it, and we've seen a move from products to experiences for sure. Yeah. What does that mean for you? Well, yeah. if you do sourcing in India, maybe you lead a tour group to India the next time you go yeah. and you make money of doing that. Like there's so there's an endless supply of money. Like there is yeah. no need for anyone to suffer not, not making enough cash. Yeah. Like all you need to do is to go into a Maserati dealership and hang out for, you know, five hours and you'll be like, there's some damn rich people in this world. Right. It's just, are you hitting them with their emotion, with what they want, not what you think they need, but what they want. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause when I was teaching a college class a while back, you know, I looked around and like every kid has the latest iPhone, every one of them. And I'm, and I know these kids are mostly working and they're, they're not a bunch of rich kids where their parents are paying for college. They just, that is their priority. That is what they're going to spend money on. What mm -hmm. is it for your group? You know? Yeah, and it's about also how you position your product to make it feel like a priority, right? Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned earlier before we started chatting, we I mentioned to you Facebook, like a lot of people throw so much money at yeah. Facebook advertising. And I said to you, it's changed. It doesn't really work. And you said, oh, no, actually, it works. So it works. tell me what you're yeah. seeing that, that's working for your clients. Okay. So there's a few things that are working that are different. Um, the first I would say is that, so with iOS changes, um, if you guys, I, probably most people know this, but yeah, just yeah. in case, it's become an option if you have an iPhone to say, don't track me in around the internet anymore. Okay. So retargeting has become much more difficult and retargeting is sort of the last stage of ads. You have like awareness and then, you know. Um, so if you have a top line ad that gets traffic and then you would retarget them to get them to buy or send a DPA, a dynamic product ad, whatever. Now, if you can't get that last thing in front of them, which is the ad that closes the sale, things are not fun on, on Facebook, right? There's a few different ways around that with like the Facebook API, things like that. But there's also a strategy that's pretty simple. So let's say I'm just going to take, um, one of my clients who she sells, um, um, like I'm trying to see who, who I should use as an example. Okay. I'm just going to take the example that I use often. Um, Erica from rare Durndal. she sells German Durndals. So for people who do like, I know, right. The tiniest niche ever. <laughs> and she kicks ass at it. Okay. She's an excellent marketer. But when I first met her, she said, marketing makes me want to throw up. So she hated it. Right. Like most of us in the beginning. Okay, so she sells these German dirndls, which is like the St. Polly girl outfit, if for those of you who don't know, because I didn't yeah. know. And Sound how of many music, people? Right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Sound of music. Okay, so let's say you're Erica. Okay, ads in general can be tricky for her because the audience is pretty small. But what you, sh you can do, what she can do and has done, is make content asking the most common questions that you get. So if it's, well, what shoes do I wear with a dirndl? Or um, how do I lace that thing up? Or how, maybe it's um, what blouse it looks good if you're small busted, right? Mm -hmm. So something that either has to do with the product or leads them down the path to the product. What you could do is you could make three videos, okay? One video is like, hey, here's, here's the top two questions I get about wearing a dirndl when you're just going Oktoberfest and you're, you know, like she has a customer that's hardcore dirndl people, yeah. like these girls who have dirndl closets and do German dancing and people like me who just go like to Munich for Oktoberfest, right? So you make three videos teaching something, anything. Hey, if you ever wondered like what to do when you're, cause now your hair's gray in the pandemic and it used to be red. Here's three things to think about what color you should wear this week, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do this. You do a two minute, five minute. It doesn't matter the time you do a video, you put up on Facebook and Instagram, you do a second one teaching and second thing, you do a third one teaching a third thing, and then you put it up organically, but then you, you can make, turn it into an ad in front of audiences that would make sense for you. Okay. And then rather than trying to so hard to get them off Facebook right away, you create these audiences on Facebook, people who watch 50% of that video, somebody who watched 75% of that video. I mean, these days, if you get someone to watch 75% of a six minute video, they're engaged with you. Yeah. Okay. And then you can show them the next thing and ask them to take the next step with you and then try to get them over to your site. Okay. So it's like micro commitments. Exactly. based on action yeah yes and you're sort of building these invisible lists yeah on the platform and, and so then, that's how you circumnavigate the whole algorithm thing that's one way yeah, yeah. and that's heavy content and it's really yeah. inexpensive to get someone if you're only going after video views very inexpensive but if somebody's watched five minutes of your video and then you pop up again and go oh you let's let me teach you this the three videos don't have to be sequential they shouldn't yeah. be sequential right Anybody who watched 50% of this, show them this. Anybody who did this, show them, hey, hop on my list and get a discount code. Show them, hey, take my quiz, like whatever, whatever else you have. The ultimate goal is a sale. Yeah. But my ultimate goal from social is to get them on your list, your, your yeah. email or your SMS list. And then once you have them on your list, you have such a higher chance of selling to somebody than yeah. just um, social media. Well, you have to send newsletters, but yeah. Oh, you have to send emails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having 
them on your list of never sending. There's not gonna, yeah. Right. So many people are afraid of sending newsletters because they think they might well, piss them I off and the they'll jump of off the list. Newsletter, like I would, I might be afraid just by the term. I that's all. Like, yes, people are afraid to send emails because they don't want to bother people. Yeah. Um, but like, how can you make your emails so fun? Like, people want to binge on them instead of like binging on Netflix, right? Like, yeah. yeah. What if you didn't do emails that were boring? How about that? Like, what if you didn't just do emails that say by myself? Yeah, exactly. There's more to it. There is more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, just, exactly. You know, bye, 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 you know? Yeah, exactly. The, the other thing you can do with Facebook ads too is um, we're starting to see it work to do a Facebook lead ad. But again, this is if you have a content strategy, if you have, I mean, everybody does. Like, so if I sell this mug, right? And maybe my mug is like, has to do with nature. Mm. And so, you know, you could offer seven ways to connect more with nature this weekend without leaving your house. Okay. It's just a PDF guide, no big deal, a little cheat sheet. Yeah. And you can run a lead ad, which I used to not be in favor of, but now with iOS 14, it seems to be working again. Oh no, I'm a big fan of this method and I do it with my clients lead ads? because yeah, complete. Well, okay. That lead magnet per se, a document that is not like buy my product, but hey, here's some value. Yes. You know, just right. offering yourself as a value and, and it's not all about your brand, but it's some other things that are going to uh, pre-qualify whoever's interested in that PDF most likely is going to be your type of client and they're going 100%. to learn something and they're going to find out how your brand also adds value as part of the proposition. So I'm a big yeah, fan of so this method. So a traditional way that I've done for years is with the clients is, and with myself is, Hey, download this cool thing. They click, they go to your landing page on your site and they download it. And then you keep in touch with them, email, all the things. However, you can't retarget as easily. So now lead ads has been around forever. I used yeah. to run them years ago. A lead ad is where you take their name and email on Facebook. They don't leave Facebook. And then you have, you know, third party software, no big deal that gets the, the lead into your customer relations management. Right. But all the, all the action is staying on Facebook. So then you know, who signed up for your thing and you can retarget them on Facebook because they never left Facebook. Yeah. 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 Smart. That's, so smart. that's a, a slight, but big difference. Yeah. Um, the cost per lead is much, much cheaper. However, the reason that I used to really not like it is the quality of the leads are not always as good because it's a, it's a very micro commitment. You don't even have to leave Facebook. You don't even have to look at somebody's um, sales page or uh, sorry, landing page for the lead magnet. Um, but let me tell you, it's a volume game. So if you're going to get leads, which my clients are at like, you know, 32 cents, uh, you can afford to get a lot of them. And then a smaller percentage might convert to a sale, but it's okay. Because your yeah. lead, your cost per lead is low. Yeah, but you can create a lookalike audience after that. I mean, you can use that data in different ways. Yeah, but only if, I mean, for the buyers though, right? Yeah. Well, because sometimes you get a bunch of leads and they just are not good and they don't ever buy. And so, yeah, we, I like to just test it and make sure they're yeah. buying. But sometimes it takes them, you know, three, four months to buy. So oh, it's I a long game. It's not a, okay. yeah, it's not a painkiller immediately. Yeah, they don't think that with Facebook ads. I think they think you should put the picture up. They buy. Yay. That's well, listen, I think the whole building a fashion brand is a long game. It's a long distance marathon. Nothing is. There's no shortcuts. If there were, I would be all in. All in. No, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just wrap this up. What would you uh, top tips would be for people who, you know, are already in the game, you know, they've invested they uh maybe just a little worried about the whole landscape and everything going on 100 percent. go deeper with the people you already have realize they bought from you for a reason and it wasn't because they couldn't find it somewhere else okay nobody's naked in this house in this in the city okay so the people who've signed up on your list, the people who bought from you, they like you, okay? You can send more emails and you can get more creative with your emails. And like, in, you know, like one of my clients who has a kid's line, she'll send out 
it just had an email that one day that was like, this is not a COVID notice from school because they're all moms and we're all getting all these 85,000 yeah. codes, right? And it was just like, hey, how are you doing? I know you're getting all these COVID notices. I know you're struggling. I'm thinking of you. Uh, P.S. We have more dinosaurs coming next week. Like it wasn't even a sales email. Yeah. But people yeah. love her because she cares about them and she relates to them and reaches out even when she's not asking for the sale. Yeah. So lean into the people you have and love them up and give them so much love and value and content and motivation and assurances and virtual hugs, and then ask for the sale another time. You can do yeah. both. Okay. So I would lean in hard in that. And the second thing I would do is I would consider TikTok. I really would. Oh, really? Um, okay. I know I don't want to either, but there's too much evidence right now of smaller brands who are using it and creating that no like and trust factor so much more quickly because you can actually get discovered over there. Yeah, well, that's what so, I was going to say because it's a younger audience, even though there's quite a lot of oldies I hear getting into it, but I think it's great for discoverability. You can get discovered, but you can then move them through the links, et cetera, somewhere else where you have a deeper connection and you develop a conversation like all social media, please get them off social media on your list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you own your list. We don't own TikTok, and you yeah. know how these, these social medias come and go and they shut down and they shut you down and like, it's no bueno, yeah. but um, yeah, it's not for teenagers anymore. And it's, I was just reading a stat that the amount of like business that's happening over there is, is it's leading every other platform right now, which I don't even know that that can be true. So I, I should probably check that stat before I say it again, but it literally was like 2021 more business. Like it, it was, it resulted in more sales than any other platform. And maybe that's because big brands are using it too. I mean, I was just there in Cartier had a TikTok ad that you clicked over and you got a little landing page that said welcome or whatever. And then the bag that they did the ad for was $2,400. And then immediately when I was looking at it for a minute, it popped up and said, hey, a brand ambassador will be with you soon to answer all your questions. Yeah. So if Cartier is working on selling $2,400 bags on TikTok, I'm pretty sure that everybody listening would maybe give yourself <laughs> a few weeks to just investigate if it would be good for you. Yeah. Well, it's again, that 20% you mentioned earlier about taking risk, right? Wild mm -hmm. risks and experimenting. I think TikTok is just faster, faster paced and it's kind of fun and it doesn't take itself too seriously. I think Instagram's kind of lost it. It's a bit too worthy and oh, I'm just bored. Personally, I'm just bored. You know what? That's an excellent point. And TikTok moves faster. Yeah. It actually is funny. And I do suggest if you just are getting started, don't follow a, a bunch of other brands. Yeah. Like go follow what you're like gardening, tennis, like whatever yeah. you're into. So you get the vibe yeah. and you see the appeal instead of just watching people do like dumb pranks. Like there's more, there's so much more to than just dancing and lip syncing going yeah, on. Yeah. And there are some, I follow some lawyers, for example, on TikTok. Yeah. I recently went into TikTok, but uh, I follow a woman who's a lawyer and she's got a very interesting way of giving bite-sized information. Someone asks a question and she just responds, you know. Oh, what does she do? Who is it? Oh, do she, you remember? Um, no, I don't, but she gives legal advice. She just basically, it's like, a, you know, little bites of morsels of information, but it's really to the point. Yes. And I think it's her son because he always says, uh, mom, uh, can... Uh, is it costly, for example, to get custody of your child? And she says, well, actually, the easiest way to do it and the one that's going to cost you less money is blah, blah, blah. And it's like done in a minute. So good. Yeah. You guys, you guys can all do this. There's one, there's, there's also what's working. There's two things. There's, um, uh, there's a, a one that's called Miss, Miss Excel, I want to say. It's oh, yes, that. yes, yes. Have you seen it? She yes. just gives Excel tips. Yeah. So fabulous. And then there's um, Mrs. Somebody who she makes these water bottles, these like multicolored water, water bottles. She has like 275,000 followers and she just shows the process of her making it and it's mesmerizing. Wow. So for any of you who make a product or if you go to the factory, 
you know, time-lapse videos, like live stream you making stuff, live stream a laser cutting machine. Like people will watch all of that on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. they really Completely. will. And you can, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just hate to have to even do one more new thing. I think like all of us, I'm like, God, really? I have now learned TikTok. But I think it's gotten to the point where if you don't jump in now, you're going to regret it. It's going to be like jumping into Instagram now, much harder than it was like seven yeah. years ago. Yeah. But the, this is a good point. I mean, everyone should find a way to get help into their business. You cannot do everything yourself. Yeah. So, and if you can't get help, what does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean someone else? Like, let's say you do have a fashion product. And you get a blogger who does the fashion tips on behalf of your brand on TikTok. Like yeah. you could do that. Um, one of my clients, she has a journal, like a, um, a planner kind of journal, and she has a version for teens. And she just sent me two of them. And my son and his best friend came home last night and like, hey guys, look what I have for you. And they were like, oh, I took a picture. Like it was so easy. Yeah. She had to send me two books. And now she has content of, cute kids using them yeah because user generated content there's nothing that beats it yeah nothing. but you know when i said what you know what are you doing why you what did i say just now my question i said why why can't you get someone to help you that's it i said why can't you get someone to help you what i meant yeah. by this was actually on the business side because i'm a lot more into the sort of the business side but if you mm -hmm. can't afford to even get a student or an intern to come and help you with social media or something like this, where is your focus? Why is your business not making money? Where are you bleeding money or leaking energy? And do you know what I mean? Yes, that's such an interesting point. Yeah, because actually my, my tip for anyone listening right now and worrying about the recession would be look at your would be look at your product range. Um, you know, how deep are you into stock? You know, can you shift something and not sit on stock that can cripple you later? Right, uh, right, right. You know, just focus on the range on what sells and don't just like experiment too much with wild ideas that are off brand. You know what? I had one of my employees tell me one time, how about you do that on your weekends, Jane? Like when I was going to develop a weird thing for the business, she's like, why don't you just make one for yourself? I was like, that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and how much time are you spending on products that are, don't have high margins? This yeah. is a big issue with yeah. our members. Yeah. They're like, well, I sell this, 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 and this. I'm like, okay, what's your best seller? Yeah. The don't dress. Ask. What's the margin? Whatever. Something crappy. I'm like, yeah. what are the margins on the calf tips? way higher i'm like why aren't you a captain business yeah like why do you lead with a product that doesn't make you money yeah well, that's my best seller yeah but it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. if you put time and resources into this product category instead that could be probably your best seller mm -hmm. right if the margin is better then why are you focused like why are you a scrunchy company at all for <laughs> some of them like <laughs> How many of them scrunchies you got to sell to sell the same as a dress? Yeah. Like, like, why are we selling break-even products at all? Ever? Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah, very interesting. Gosh, this conversation can go on forever, but uh, that's been amazing. I think we have some really good stuff to help people. And by the way, guys, all the things I said, like, don't do that. I've done it all. Yeah, I know. Me too. 100% focused on products that didn't make tons of money thinking, well, it's a good seller. Yeah, makes no sense looking back, but at the time it was very, oh, seemed right to me. I think it's a rite of passage. Everyone does the same mistakes, no matter what someone tells you. It's just, you just have to burn your fingers to know yourself. I think that's a, that's a good part of it. That is. Yeah. So my so, challenge today would be like, what did you guys learn? Is there one thing here that you're like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to try that. Like, is there something that one of us said that you're like, I should do that. And normally I would file it away in my should do pile, but I'm actually going to try it. What would it, what would it be? I'd love exactly. to know. Amazing. So Jane, where can people find you if they want to get more of you? Yeah, They can find us at fashionbrainacademy.com. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Perfect. Well, so much, so much fun. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Speak to you again soon. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. 
Hey, thank you for tuning into the show and listening all the way to the end. If you want to know more about any information referred to in this episode, we've got all the links listed in the show notes, which you can find over at www.fashioninsiders.co forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and conversation, make sure to subscribe to the show and get new episodes downloaded as soon as they come out. And if you have any questions, I'd love to help you. Email me your questions to insider at fashioninsiders.co or just send me a DM over on Instagram. Finally, I'd really appreciate it if you could open up the app on your phone and leave me a super quick rating or review. Your reviews tell iTunes that this is a great podcast and it's worthwhile listening and sharing. And that can help me and my guests reach even more people. So that's it for today. I'll be back soon with another episode. And until then, thank you again for listening.